Take me to the water. Take me to the water. Take me to the water to be baptized. None but the righteous. None but the right. None but the right shall see God. That when I was um, growing up uh, using Greyhound to get from Chicago to Mississippi, uh, stopping in Memphis for a hot dog so that my mom could put Vaseline on my face in any other place that was dry, I questioned the value of southernness. I questioned the things that I saw, their beauty that the house we had in Mississippi and the barn that we had in Mississippi, uh, those things didn't seem to have anything redemptive. They were just old shacks. The scrap art that I saw was just a bunch of junk. That, that the way that I saw was from a, a young, urban Chicago city slicker know-it-all seventh grader, <laughs> that I was convinced that the drawl that my cousins had uh, made me smarter, that there was something about the way I talked and the way they talked that was a little different, and that difference was uh, another kind of black, that when I thought of the South and I thought of my family, I thought that the North had something better that there was a way in which the beauty of those songs, the beauty of those monuments, um, they were just rituals that had no real value yet. I found myself over the last couple years um, spending time in other countries, looking at other fish shacks, looking at other uh, uh, fields of wheat and rice when I look at those other fields, because I'm in Japan, I think, wow, what a beautiful shack. <laughs> that there was something about the combination of difference and otherness and, and my dislocation that made the shack in Japan more beauty, beautiful. That I found myself in this, real, really, like this really hard moment where I was not sure about what I valued. Like, why was I struggling so much to understand the beauty inherent in the things that were around me in my Yazoo City, Silver City, Greenwood, Greenville, Isola, Indianola, the Delta, Clarksdale, where I went to an auction sale. Right? And over the last four or five years, I found myself really trying to ask hard questions about what are those histories and those things familiar to me, and how can I bear witness to some of the beauty that I'm only just starting to really understand. What is the redemptive value of these materials that black men and women have touched? I feel like my art practice has come to really um, ask questions about the seventh grader. And in a moment where uh, post-colonialism has kind of shrouded me with a kind of ignorance of what's beautiful and making decisions about certain kinds of beauty over other kinds, I want to just share with you how beauty is starting to play out and how the idea of redemptive materials link me and Thornton Dial. That I think Fred and I together decided on 
uh, this piece, Monument to the Minds of the Little Negro Steelworkers, for a lot of different reasons, that they had a quality of redemption in them, that there was a way in which the steel, that, that where Thornton could have chosen another kind of material now in his um, affluence, that there's still something that resonates. Um, why use these materials? Why, why so much the things from the yard? What is that about? And I think part of that is about kind of an, an, an acceptance of the value of the things in, innately around us, inherent within us. I want to play with that. And in lots of different ways, not just around blackness, I've been trying to recover parts of myself. A part of me that's like an urban planner that went to school to study how cities function and how they dysfunction and how laws and bureaucracies help cities move forward and keep people in cities where they are. In addition to that urban planning practice, I was also a potter. A potter marginalized by a, a contemporary art world that I was clawing to be a part of a culture, part of a regime that really wasn't interested in the things that I felt dearest about, that were most important to me that clay for me was a humble material, and that the way of a potter was something that I really felt good about, that there was, a, there was a kind of labor in it that reminded me of the fields that I grew up working in, that the, the cotton fields that people are kind of cliche, like talk about in cliche, were the fields that I worked every summer when I went back to Belzona and Yazoo City. There was something about clay that had work in it that reminded me of my father and my grandfather and my mother and my grandmother, and that I could be productive. You know, that, that I think I just, like we have, like, you know, black folk have like this labor gene in them. Like we, we really like it or we really detest that part of ourselves, you know, that I wanted to figure it out. And so I found myself asking questions about this material clay. How does it fit? Where does it fit? And I think in some ways, Clay has become a metaphor for some other marginal things. In 2004, I got a call from a guy named Ken Dunn, who's a recycle expert. Um, Ken Dunn had gone to the west side of Chicago, where I was from, and had found um, uh, this Wrigley's chewing gum manufacturing plant. Um, and he said, the Aster, you know, I, I went to this, this plant, and you really should see uh, all this wood, they had these conveyor pallets. You should um, come and see if you want to do something with them artistically. You know? um, I went to Ken's warehouse, and, and there were all these wooden boards thrown around, um, wrapped in these pallets, um, saran wrapped, and in, in between the saran wrap, you could see um, the years and years of um, uh, infestation by mice and rats, the years of powdered sugar, the urine, it had this powdered sugar and shit smell together. You know, that it was both um, sweet and corrupt, that there was something about the sweetness that lended itself to a kind of corruption. And Ken said, Ken said oh, the acid, well, you know, you can just clean them off and they'll be really good for something, you know, but Ken had 10,000 of these boards, right? And the boards were from the neighborhood that I grew up in. And Ken finally just said, I just don't know what to do with them all. And I found myself like thinking about these brown boards in relationship to brown people on the west side of Chicago, thinking about the post-industrial Wrigley's chewing gum, thinking about all of the folk who ended up unemployed as a result of Wrigley's chewing gum moving their location, and thought that the brown hands that had touched these boards were actually on these boards, that there was a kind of, the, the brown boards carried this kind of cultural memory. Maybe there's a way that I can redeem them. Maybe there's a way that these boards could move through the cultural sphere, and in that movement, there could be a kind of redemption. So I took the boards and I created a small uh, temple. Um, at the time, I didn't have uh, very much of an art career. There were, no, there were no museums that were really looking at my work. Um, so I rented a space for myself so that I could show this, these, these boards. It was the first stab at redeeming this material. So I cleaned them off, um, and I told Ken, I'll take a couple thousand. 
you know. Um, so I cleaned them up and I created this, this space. People came to the space. Um, it was beautiful. It looked um, oral and um, monastic. Um, and it was at this moment that I decided that the temple needed some monks. It needed some performative activity. It needed to be engaged, you know. That I think one of the things that I found with artists like myself and Thornton is that um, you want, when you're from a, a place of belief, um, things function. That, that art ain't just art. Art is the beginning of a, of a dialogue between you and other people. I found myself wanting to use this space, and from that, the black monks uh, were born. Uh, it was the first time that I had created art that was not material specific, that it was not clay. And in that moment, the contemporary art world um, became interested in the work. They thought, um, you know, we knew that the Astor could think about things, but now that he's made this uh, interesting material shift, maybe there's place for it in the museum, that there was something about um, the material, in this case, that um, had a redeeming quality around what I thought about, that it was this strange moment where um, it was just the material that shifted that caused people to reimagine my value. That was interesting. So I asked the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago if instead of um, building a building inside of a building, could I take over a space in the museum, making the museum my temple? Could I bring my black monks of Mississippi into the space and have church? Could we have our monastic conversations free and for the public? Could we invite in a group of folk to the museum that maybe you're not familiar with, but are no less cultured? <clears throat> that I wanted to, in some way, uh, redeem the museum space. That I wanted to re-sacralize the museum. That, that if there was a kind of uh, uh, holy agnosticism, I wanted to bring uh, the, the Holy Ghost or any other number of ghosts that might come as a result of open my, opening my mouth. That I wanted to fight um, the idea that this was only a minimalist af affect. I wanted to be the potter that I was and have the space function. And so we rocked out. You know, we were gone, Sun Ra style, Saturn heaven, Jesus. <laughs> you know, it was, it was awesome. And what, it, what, what this did was it allowed, uh, it moved the materials from a sweet odor to a, a, a nothing space, a neutral zone, whereby another group of people in the cultural sphere could decide that it had a certain kind of value and then move it to another space, the museum. Um, after the Museum of Contemporary Art, it was around the time that the scouting was happening for the Whitney Biennial. And a group of curators, you know, curators get together and they talk about, you know, who's doing what and who's good to work with and who you want to avoid. And I think I must have gotten some good reviews um, and, and Francisco, uh, Francesco Bonomi asked me to be part of the Whitney Biennial. And so there I was, moving these materials again from the west side to downtown, to the heart of downtown, to New York. And there was a way that at, at each point they, the, the, the objects were gaining value in this funny way. These objects that were sweet and stinky, infested and shat upon were also at the heart of a critical cultural dialogue. That there was a way in which these things that could have been burned for firewood had gotten a moment to be cleaned up, put in a place where other people could ask questions about their value. And I think what I'm really excited about in this conversation about Thornton Dial is that it's not whether or not things deserve the right to be in one place or another but that things deserve the right to be. And that what I'm excited about is that they're here for us all to look at, right? That Bill and his family has created an opportunity to redeem these things from the obscurity of nothingness, right? From uh, the possibility of neglect, right? That, that they've gone from this private person's 
dream of redemption to a shared opportunity for redeeming, right? At the same time, I was struggling with the fact that all these things were happening in museums, and I had this heart for our cities. That there was, another, there, was a, there was a redemption happening in the gestural world, in the world of the imaginary, but there was no discourse around what do we do with our real cities. That there was a way in which redemption hadn't come yet um, to the city. So I thought I'd just like take a second to lay out how I imagine one piece of work in relationship to the idea of redemption. That there's this abandoned building in my neighborhood. So I took the building and dismantled the building. Um, the objects from that building, I wanted to, to, I wanted to redeem them. I wanted, them um, I wanted people to know that the west side and the south side of Chicago, that North Omaha and North St. Louis, that our black and blighted places had things that were worth keeping had things that were worth being proud of, that I wanted to take tokens and gestures from these places, clean them off, and put them in a space where people could go, oh my gosh, that's really cool. So I would take these, these moments of reconstituting buildings and then put them in public display. I would load them so that when Brother Julian Bond talks about the, the fire hose, that the third picture that you see um, on your right is, a, is kind of asking questions about the racialized and geographied city. That how could this moment where you, when you think of Bowie's and Duchamp, how can this moment of contemporarity also be loaded with the fact that life for a lot of people in the city hasn't been so pleasant? That the hose becomes both a trump ploy and an opportunity to seriously engage a dialogue about race and space in our cities. I was trying to at the same time be part of a regime of contemporary practice, part of a regime of contemporary, and at the same time really wedded to struggle, wedded to a set of things that I know if I can put these things in the cultural sphere, the cultural sphere might give me something back that I could bring back to the South Side. So I sold the hoes, and the hoes sold for a lot of money, and the hoes, my gallery gave me half the money from the hoes. And half of the money that was made from that machine that creates imaginary money allowed me to have real impact on the blacks outside. I, I ended up buying a small bookstore that had been an, uh, an important art and architecture bookstore uh, in the heart of downtown that I told this guy who was retiring at 82, Bill, if you let me buy these books, I'll create a reading room on the south side. I'll bring other architects and designers to be in conversation with people on my block so that the block could be more beautiful. We'll have our first library in this, this area of the city. And that the thing that my alderman couldn't do, art could do. That if my alderman couldn't imagine a library for the blacks outside in this neighborhood, I could. That I think that art is the possibility of things. That Thornton's work is the possibility of things. It's born out of a set of beliefs, not born out of a desire to enter a market. And that be with belief as the machine and art as a tool, you can start to like navigate all kinds of cultural spheres. That I found myself then in this conversation between the museum and between the city asking what could the cultural sphere lend me? How could I le leverage the work that I'm doing as a cultural worker to have serious consequence in neighborhoods? It felt like SNCC. It felt like I had an opportunity to be in front of culture, be in front of the political institutions of this country and say, look, there are some inadequacies. There are some imbalances. Is there a way that we can use this cultural moment, this platform, this podium, this thing, to ask harder questions about the city? I found myself accidentally becoming interested in uh, abandoned buildings, asking uh, not the Matt Clark question, like, since destruction is inevitable, how can I um, frame that moment? I didn't want tokens from the buildings. I wanted restoration. I wanted redemption. I wanted these buildings not to be torn down. I wanted these buildings to stand. I wanted them to be a kind of testament to the possibility inherent in raw material, 
inherent in the possibility of labor, inherent in the uh, underserved, out of work brothers that were around my block. I wanted to put these brothers uh, to work. You know, I wanted to create, I wanted these objects that were loaded in the cultural sphere to try to create new opportunities for other people. But it wasn't just the redemption of raw material. The University of Chicago had um, 80,000 glass lantern slides from the art history department. That even in the art world, there are ways in which um, redeeming materials um, don't work that I, I wanted to ask questions, how could I start to redeem bodies of knowledge, right? How could we use this idea of the artist who uses the discarded as the point of de departure to ask questions about like, what is important? And what I found with these glass lantern slides was that it wasn't that the images weren't important to art history, it was the materiality of the images. That why would you have 80,000 glass lantern slides that weigh eight tons when you could just have uh, a thumb drive. <laughs> and there we were again, discarding the value of the material thing um, for the image, for the gesture of the thing. That there's, there's no need for the object when we could have our imaginations. And, it, and so I, I think that there's this way in which um, Thornton's work gave me an opportunity to, to reflect upon, again, not necessarily these uh, silos of uh, is it this kind of art or is it that kind of art, but this idea that artists have the capacity to act as um, potters, to, to take um, what is the seeming nothing of American culture, of the disregarded, and transform that nothing into things that are obviously a form of somethingness. Thank you. <laughs>